This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Another preseason game in the books. One week closer to the regular season, Colts-Texans, which we can't wait for. But game against the Lions today, what was the final score? 27-26? Yeah. Going for two there at the end with a chance to win it. No overtime now. So, I mean, theoretically, you could kick the extra point and die. But who the hell cares? It's a preseason game. Jack Cohn taking us down the field there at the end, making a nice pass. Finding the end zone, we come up a point short, going for two, which I think you have to do in that situation. Let the guys go out there and put it on the line. These guys out there just having fun at the end of these preseason games. And I think today reminded me how much I hate the preseason, how boring the preseason is, how much we love our fans on For the Culture, sacrificing our Saturday. I'm here at the beach. I'm sacrificing my Saturday watching preseason football for you guys but at the same time you hear sam ellinger talk and this is a guy who could easily go his whole career without ever starting an nfl game this guy might never throw an nfl touchdown pass in the regular season and then there's a lot of guys that might never see a regular season roster or field or play in an nfl game and then you realize their wives and girlfriends and parents and siblings and best friends are in the crowd and it means a lot to them. So I do try to keep that balance to be respectful of the guys that are out there because they did work their asses off. They worked their tails off to get to this point. And then we kind of take it for granted sometimes because we want to see the regular season games. And there's things that we watch in this and there are guys that are battling and scratching and clawing to make the roster. And there are guys that their performances in these games will help them make rosters and go on to have successful NFL careers. So there's a lot going on in these preseason games, but at the same time as a fan and we get spoiled with regular season games and playoff games, they can get a bit tedious and a bit boring at times, but all in all, I do try to keep it in perspective for some of the younger guys and some of the guys that might never see daylight in a regular NFL game. And we had some guys that made big plays at the end that might never see the Colts regular season roster. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting game. And certainly, I really think the only two starters I saw were Pinter, maybe prior for a few snaps, and then Cross on defense. So it was mainly backups and, and, and further down the depth chart. And, and whew, uh, the defense left a lot to be desired. Uh and the offense was was better. I thought the offense was a lot better this week. I thought Ellinger built on what he did last week. He was really good. Foles was much better this week. Cone was much better this week. Um, the big takeaways I have from this game are Patman and Strawn stepped up. Um, defensively, I thought uh, uh, Dio played really well and Taekwon played really well. Those are my big takeaways. Outside of that, man, uh, this is kind of just a throwaway game for me. I mean, yeah. there's not a lot else to be said. No, I say my kind of felt the same way. And I thought Sam again played well, like you said. I thought Dio played well, especially in the second half. But at that point, who are you going up against? Because he's playing late into a second preseason game where there was no starters. And he's a guy we did draft in the second round last year. And we expect big things out of. So he's making an impact late in this game that we kind of expect in the near future for him to make against starters in this league. So baby steps, of course, and this is a guy who's coming off a torn Achilles two years ago. We've seen ruptured Achilles tendons and careers, and this guy had one before his even started. So you have to take all that into perspective. And you also have to go to (laughs) manscaped.com and use promo code culture for 20% off and free shipping and handling. You get, you could even get this, Wonderful little carry case. I brought it to the beach. I'm at the beach today, if you guys couldn't already tell. And if I could just open the zipper right here, you could just carry it all. And it doesn't need to be Manscaped products. You could put anything you want in the carrying case. Your toothbrush, your deodorant, whatever you might need. Your bowl deodorant. Yes, they make bowl deodorant at Manscaped.com. And we thank our friends at Manscaped for supporting the For the Culture podcast. This right here, I told my brother this is waterproof. It blew his freaking mind. You could use it in the shower. You could use it in the ocean, in the lake, in the river, wherever you want to use it. It's waterproof. There's no plugs because you just put it right into the dock and it charges like that. Wow. That is new age technology. Since when did Elon Musk start working at manscaped.com? Because this is next level stuff below the waist yeah i mean uh i think that 
Manscape was probably more inter- you know entertaining than this game was. Bro, although the game was no, no. Entertaining. Before before the game, leading up to one o'clock on ESPN eight, the Ocho is what ESPN eight is called. I didn't even know ESPN went up that high. It must be a streaming channel, but they were playing one of their ESPN eight sports because they have axe throwing and all these crazy sports that you've never heard of or never seen or didn't know existed at the professional level. They were playing them on ESPN two. And I just happened to be watching it this morning when I woke up leading up to the Colts game and they had professional or some type of professional co-ed kickball where they were bouncing the ball in. It was not your middle school kickball where the fat kid's the best player. These were athletes. <laughs> everybody everybody was an athlete out there. And like everybody was like division one in this. They were like division one track and field, picked up you know, picked up kickball later in life. And it was brought to you by Manscaped as well. So they had Michael Buffer doing a commercial. They had Marshawn oh Lynch God. doing a commercial. The entire thing. There was not another commercial. Everything, and it was a running clock too. So in between innings, they had to switch real quick, especially the losing team. They were boom. They were right out in the field, right up at the bat, because they just wanted to keep the game moving so they could try to score some runs and stay in the game. And everything was Manscaped, 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 Manscaped. And ESPN 8. So I learned that today. <laughs> Yeah, I had some people reach out to me. They've actually gotten the uh, the Manscaped stuff, and they really they like it. So yeah, good. So yeah, my brother had a friend that used promo code Culture C O L T U R E at checkout, and he's thrilled. Everybody's thrilled with the product. So am I, guys. It does wonders down there. It's great. It really yeah. is. It's uh something better than the preseason. Every guy, every guy should have it for sure. Every guy should have it, and. They do stuff for like testicular cancer and stuff. So they're making inroads outside of the jokes and the gimmicks. It's a legit right. product and they really, it's a US made. It's made in America. So a lot of really good things there at Manscaped. And, you know, I get through these preseason games knowing that I'm going to use my Manscaped afterwards and hopefully one thing leads to another, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but guys, you are one me week on closer to the regular season. I think that's really what we should be focusing on here but and i just i saw your tweet too about ben banigu because a lot of narratives this year are gonna get squashed everybody thought it was gonna be like a flip the script on for the culture these guys love flus because he came on their podcast a couple times but again we were just speaking facts the entire season we criticized flus many times at the end of that jet game we won that game Right. We criticized him. We criticized him a bunch when it was warranted. And one of the big narratives was that he hated Ben Banigo. And now we have he helped, a- dra- he helped draft him, Luke. That's the most ridiculous thing about it. Like he yeah. would flu helped dra- they, they talked to their coaches. How does this guy fit? The narrative that he that there was some personal thing is ridiculous. Uh, it came from Banigo and his camp, his trainer. Uh, and through a couple people that everybody knows as as Colt commentators, I'm not going to say their names, but you all know who I'm talking about. Uh, it's not true. No coach sets himself up to fail. If no. he could play, he'd be on the field. It's ridiculous. Um, 100%, you- especially a defense that has lacked pass rush the last few years. That would yeah, be a spot. It, it, you would love a second-round guy to flourish. I mean, we well, there was nothing vindictive. There was never an no. agenda. And the crazy thing, Jason, Ben Banigou looked better the preseason last year with Flus than he has this year. I, two I preseason games. He's making more plays last year, and his name was all over training camp. Wasn't able to get on the field much during the regular season. And the biggest play of the guy's career still came his rookie season three years ago. So, or four years ago at this point, whatever it's been. 2019, was it? Yeah. Against Joe Flacco, and Flacco was... Was Flacco still a Raven at that point? No, I think it was a Bronco. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was against the Broncos. It was Flacco with the Broncos. Yeah, that was right. 2019. So, you know, it's been a long time for Ben Bandigo. It's kind of now or never, and it's looking like never, at least in Indianapolis. But like you were saying, going into the first preseason game, if he doesn't fit uh, Gus Bradley defense, he's probably not going to fit any defense because this defense is more set to his skill set than Flus's defense was. So it's a little bit disheartening for Ben Banigou. And I wish him the best because I don't think he'll succeed here. I think he'll move on and he'll get a chance elsewhere. And I hope he cashes in and I hope he proves us wrong and everybody wrong. But up until this point in Indianapolis, it just doesn't look like that. Yeah, I mean, nobody I, – I, of course we want him to succeed. If he was great, we would – our pass rush would be great. And and it, so I don't wish failure on any Colts player. And, and, and I don't wish – so – 
But the thing today about this game that was really disappointing for me personally, you know, I watched the entire game, was the D-line was awful. I mean, outside of Taekwon, Early, Dio, and uh, and Ifieri, uh, I dang, but I don't know how to say his last name, but he made a couple plays. 59. I know that's all I know is his number. Mm-hmm. But outside of those three guys, I mean, they didn't set the edge at all in the run game. At all. There were, the tackling was piss poor in this game. Um the, there was no pressure. I mean, there was a little pressure later, but early on there was no pressure. Um, they couldn't stop the run to save their life. The middle was soft as butter. It was it was not a good look for the Colts defense or their depth backups. Uh, the D line, the interior especially, was horrendous. I thought yeah. uh, against and the they, run. they didn't set the edge well either. I no, they didn't. The run, I mean, the DNs. B- Banigu was awful setting the edge. So I mean, Dial had a couple plays where he didn't do it. Um, that, the the one thing I'm worried about with Gus Bradley's defense is it's an aggressive attack front, and teams are going to take advantage of that, especially with some of the alignments that you'll see. You'll see two and two in a middle gap, and teams can, you know, and you get a middle run there, draw play. That's one concern I have with this defense is the over-aggressiveness of the D-line trying to get to the quarterback and allow allowing gash runs because today, I mean, they had a bunch of those. Uh and it's an over, you know, and, and one thing about Fluce's defense, everybody always bitched about, oh, our pass rush, our pass rush. But one thing you never had to worry about was it never got shredded by a run game, ever. I don't think the entire time – there might have been one or two games where they really had bad games, and there was probably like a Tennessee game where Derrick Henry had like a 60-yard touchdown. I think the COVID game, their run defense wasn't great, but they didn't have half their D line in that game. Um, but – this defense with Bradley, I think, is going to be susceptible to the run, and that's concerning to me. Mm-hmm. Obviously, not with these players, but with yeah. our starters. That's what I'm concerned about. I want to see when those guys play how they're going to do it versus the run. I would much rather have, a, you know, a team that allows run yards than pass yards, so I can live with that. But I, I don't want to see them getting gashed to the point where teams just keep our offense off the field. That's what happened with yeah. with when we had Freeney and Mathis. Teams just gashed us with the run and tried to keep Manning off the field, and I don't want to see that happen to this team. No, especially because you're not going to get the upside of the Freeney and Mathis defenses no. because you don't have the – like they would get to the quarterback enough where it's like, all right, I'll take the good with the bad. I'll take the gashes right. because they're going to get home a combined 20 times a year. You don't have two defensive ends, at least at this point, Point, and we hope that Quiddy Pay and Dio and other guys get to that level eventually. But right now, we don't have anybody at that level, let alone two guys at that level. So the pros aren't going to be positive enough to outweigh the cons of that style defense. But I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on that yet because of who's out there right now. No, you're you right. Have backup guy. No, I, I know. I know you know. So, like, I'm just saying. In I don't general, think it'll be a problem, just, Luke. I don't think it's going to be a problem, but I'm just saying it's it's something to look at. I definitely, definitely don't something think they're... to keep in mind, but I'm just right. saying from a game like like that's just a general statement to keep in mind outside right. of today's performance. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I just think it's it's one of the nuances to the you know the the one difference in Flus's defense versus uh, Bradley's is it's more of an attack front getting to the quarterback, whereas Flus was about setting the edge. Yes. That's why you saw a lot of AQM out there. Um, and, we, and then this is going to be more about getting to the quarterback, which I love. You know, I'm all about aggressiveness, press coverage, all that stuff. But you got to at least slow the run down, and they didn't do a good job of that today at all. That's true. And if you guys are wondering why I'm wiping the top of my nose right now, I had a scab right there, and I picked it right before we started. I'm not used to the video thing. I just expect <laughs> nobody to see us and us to just roll out and speak. So it was bleeding pretty bad. And – Right before we have an awning above me right now, if you can see. Nice. See yep. I banged the shit out of my head right before we started. So I don't know in... much from the game. If Luke, anything. are you in concussion protocol? I'm in concussion protocol. Yes. Yeah. I'm day to day. But you're right trending now. in the right, you're trending in the right direction, like Chuck always said, right? Yeah, they're gonna run me around on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh um... gosh. Listen, he's got an ankle. We're going to run him around on Wednesday, see where he's at. He's got an ankle. ankle. He's got an ankle. Ankle. Everybody's got two ankles, Chuck. <laughs> um, Luke, one thing I wanted to touch on uh, as far as 
um, offensively in this game. I, I really was happy to see Patman and Strong get out there and step yeah. up. I thought they were outstanding. Both uh, found Foles. the end zone, which was nice. Yeah, they they were. I think both of those guys. This game was might it doesn't mean anything to us, but I think it solidified the roster spots. I think we keep six. I think those two are the the back end guys. Um, Strong to me. And Patman was, I mean, Patman was really good. I mean, he got real, I mean, he did a hell of a job on that crosser. Um, but Strawn to me is such a huge wild card um, with, with his size and speed combination. Those two guys, I mean, both of them really, they could make a big difference on this roster. Um, I, I think we're going to stick with what we have there. Um, but yeah, today offensively, it was all about the passing game. We couldn't do anything on the ground. Uh, we got mauled by, and it, it kind of goes with what we heard out of out of camp that the D line for Detroit was giving our offensive line some trouble. Um, you know, specifically, Penner had some trouble uh, in, in, during training camp uh, with, the, the, with the Lions' inner squad practices. And today, that kind of is what we saw. They dominated as far as the run game. They just they stopped it. We I don't know how many yards we ended up with, but at one point we had 11 yards, and they had like 130. So. Um, that was not great, but again, this is a passing league and, and we were able to stay in this game, throwing the ball. I'm going to tell you what, Luke, uh, it's a long shot, but man, how can you not be impressed with Sam Ellinger with no, everything that true. kid's been through? I mean, off the field, his father passed at a young age with his brother last year. That dude is tough as nails mentally. Nothing's going to shake him. He's constantly working to get better. He's worked with Tom house, uh, to improve his mechanics up his velocity because we've always talked about his arm being his weakness. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, man, he's got command of the offense. He's a great leader. I wouldn't bet against him. I really would. He he's got all the things you want in the quarterback. If he ever gets that, that accuracy and that arm strength to the point where it's just average, he can, he can play in this league and he's shown that in the last two games. I'm, I'm uber impressed with him. I'm not saying he's going to be the number two quarterback. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Probably not going to keep three QBs, but I can't say enough about him. He's been my MVP of the preseason. As far I mean, there doesn't mean anything, but he's been so good, so fun to watch the way he runs around. That throw he made on the run took a big hit to Patman in the end zone. Um, oh, yeah. Outstanding play. I'm 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 happy. I couldn't be happier for a kid who's been through so much. He's a, he's just a great kid. And he's worked his butt off, and you can see the incremental improvement. I'm just really happy for him and his family. You absolutely can. And what's that saying about the difference between player A and player B or the difference between a starter and a backup or a starter and a guy who doesn't even make a roster it could just be opportunity. And sometimes when right. opportunity comes knocking, and that's one of the beauties like we opened up about in the preseason – you could make your mark. It might not be in Indianapolis, and it probably won't be in Indianapolis because this isn't the best. It's not like we have the best quarterback in the league in Indy right now, but we have a very tough quarterback room because obviously Matt Ryan's your starter, and Sam Ellinger's not coming in here and taking that starting job away from Matt Ryan. And then your backup is a guy who won a Super Bowl as a backup with your head, with your coach, head coach. And they yep. gave him a two-year contract. So it's yep. just a tough quarterback room to solidify a roster spot in. They're probably not going to carry three. I mean, it's a theoretical possibility they do, and they do like Sam a lot, and we know they like him a lot, and they would love to get him back to the practice squad. But this opportunity could find him on – a waiver claim, waiver wire, pick up somewhere else where he has a spot on a roster. You just never know because he has played really good football. His ability to keep plays alive yeah. with his legs is the best in this room. Foles and Ryan are not keeping plays alive the way the way Sam is right now with his legs. And then Patman had a really nice day today. And yeah, yeah. remember, these guys, most of these guys, like Patman today being a starter and being one of the top two receivers that was on the field today, he came out probably before halftime, finishes with five catches, 103 yards and a touchdown, keeping that play alive, being able to have the whereabouts and the heads up to be able to reach the ball out across the plane, yep. not able to get up, but still able to get in the end zone. Strawn finding the end zone, three catches, 45 yards. So those two receivers looked really good together, put up just about just about 150 yards, two touchdowns on nine receptions, and Sam Ellinger a big part of both of their days today. So really impressed with that 
second into third unit of guys. Some guys we'll see make the team, like the two receivers, I believe will be five and six on the depth chart. And then they're going to probably have to step up at some point when Paris Campbell gets hurt and other guys are going to go down with injury at some point, whether it's a week or two weeks or whatever, they're going to have to be ready to play. And I feel a little bit better about the depth of the receiving core. And I never really questioned the depth of the core. And this has kind of been my feelings on the wide receiver position since Chris Ballard's been here. It's really been a lack from the top. It hasn't been a lack from the bottom. We've always been pretty confident in number, I would say, five, six, the first guy cut. Like, we've had pretty good practice squad receivers. We've had a lot of times where I was like, you know what? This guy could be a number four anywhere, and he's a number four for us, or he is a number six for us. He could be number four anywhere. But the problem is everybody else has a better one, too. And that's really where I've been caught up at the receiver position. We've been deep there where our five through eight on the practice squad could compete with anybody. But where's our veteran presence? Like outside of Pittman, does anybody in this receiving core have more than 40 uh, receptions for their career? I saw they put up Paris Campbell stats. He's at 34, (laughs) I think, for his career. I don't think anybody, obviously Alec Pierce has none. I would no. say Patman has less than 20, but you would have to fact check me and maybe I'll put up a stat sheet right here so you guys could see career stats. But I don't think anybody has more than 40 outside of Pittman. And before yeah, last year, I, he didn't have 40. So yeah, for me, yeah. For it's me, really it was, a lack of experience. Yeah. And that legit, like, I think Pittman is turning into a number one, but he's a back end number one. Like, he's probably somewhere from like 10 to 15 in the league. Well, Some other teams have like multiple top 10 guys or multiple top 20 guys. And like we have one and then a drop off after Pittman. And Pittman only has one year as that guy. So even Pittman as our true number one, I believe he solidified himself last year with a bad quarterback in Wentz. He's kind of on an island. So if you take him out of the game, where's the experience of this receiving core? The most experienced guy has spent more time off the field than on the field in Paris Campbell. So That's where the problem is. That's where I almost want to bring back a guy like T.Y. or bring somebody in where it's it's not even about what do they have in the tank. It's really just I want a guy who's been there before because most of these guys haven't been there before. But where I like this receiving core is the depth. The fact that we could have guys that go five, six, seven deep making an impact in today's game against other teams' backups, like we saw out of Patman and we saw out of Strawn. That's the strength of our receiver core. But it doesn't help you when they can only get on the field when other guys get hurt, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm over T.Y. I love him, but he's too – He his burst is gone and the yeah. injuries no, are – Yeah, I'm just saying, for example, like right, you know, right, experience right, right. But, and he's just the name I threw out. But I agree with your bigger point, which is they need somebody to take the pressure off Pittman. Obviously, you got Taylor to do a little bit, but that's in the run game. You're going to use him more in the passing game as, as well. A guy I would look at, and I know the Colts fan base is probably going to hate the name I'm about to say because of things that don't have anything to do with football. We're not going to get into that here. But just strictly football related, a guy I would absolutely love to see the Colts sign because he's productive. His last two seasons in Buffalo, he had 82 catches. And that's Cole Beasley. He's a slot receiver. He he is a security blanket for every quarterback he's played for, whether that be Josh Allen or you can go all the way back, I think, to Tony Romo. Um, he's got experience. He knows how to play the game. The dude never misses any games. He's he I, I put his stats up a week or so ago when I was talking about guys we could look at. I don't think he's missed a game in like four years, except uh, may, maybe one for a suspension or something. And then Emmanuel Sanders is another guy, but I'm not sure if he's completely healthy. Um, but outside of that, and, and Odell Beckham, but he's not going to be ready. So that's, that's not till what, October, November. So I would rather just roll with what we have than sign T.Y. But if you're talking to me about like Beasley, I think he can still play. Because if you look at T.Y.'s, his stats have gone incrementally down. And yeah. he's been hurt more and more. And he's coming off a neck injury, which is serious. And his burst, if you watch the film, is gone. Now you look at Beasley, his two best reception-wise seasons – are his last two. He's had 164 receptions in the last two years. Add up all the Colt receivers. Do they have that many receptions? I mean, just all of them in two years? Maybe. But my point is, 
you can you can you know I I understand the argument. Well, not really, actually, because it's not a crime. But whatever, you can disagree. Well, with his, I know his, you said you didn't want to talk about it on the show. What was it? The vaccine? Yeah, his he was very outspoken about the vaccine, and I know a lot of people don't like that, and I'm not a big fan of it either. But it has nothing. It's not illegal to have that opinion. First of all, second of all, it has nothing to do with football, and this is a football show. So as far as actually getting out, and plus, I don't think COVID is an issue anymore as far as playing. It's not like it was. So you bring him in, the guy's going to produce, and he doesn't miss time. So I, I don't I, like. I really don't get the argument against it unless it's money, and I don't think he's going to cost that much. He said on Twitter that, that teams have reached out to him, but the Colts haven't been one of them, and I don't really understand it. It's got to be the Midwest thing. I, I don't know. But as far as production goes – the guy still can play and, and he's never hurt. So I don't understand what, why they wouldn't look at that unless they're going to ride with these guys. And if that's what they're going to do, I trust Chris Bauer. I trust the guys. I mean, I know Pittman's going to be good, but my concern is what if Paris Campbell gets hurt? What if Alec Pierce and doesn't I develop with Campbell? It's when it's not it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I hate and to say what, that. And I hope I'm wrong. And that's right. part of why I think like that, because right now, first off, no proof of concept. He's able to stay healthy in this league. But the other reason I think like that is because since I really do expect that I'm just being honest, right. if he does play and stay healthy the whole season, it's kind of like a house money get because. And I think he'd be great. Out. I If he could stay healthy, Luke, I think he would make explosive plays. Oh, a hundred percent. And then the room's not that bad because no. then you have Pittman. Then you have Campbell, who I do think is a legit number two. Of course, we're going to see Hines. I think we should see Hines more in the pass game, especially if you know, you're going to have Philip Lindsay, maybe Deion Jackson. We have enough guys back there. Once yep. in a while, you're going to want to give Hines a carry because he gives you something that nobody else back there could give you. And then on right. third downs, it's nice to have him in the backfield as a receiving threat out of the backfield. But he's a guy that can be lined up in the slot. He can be lined up out wide. You could do so many different things with him. And now you have a quarterback who gets the ball out of his hands quick and quicker than the last guy. So we should see Hines utilize more in the and Taylor. game, especially and Taylor. because yeah. that's a position of need. And he's a guy that has a skill set that could help you there. He's probably yeah. second on the team right now in receptions behind. He probably is number one in career receptions. Yeah. I mean, he's an outstanding receiver out of the backfield. I think Taylor is as well. He's really good. Um, yeah, I think you're going to see Hines in the slot a lot. I mean, if P I love Pierce. Like, don't get me wrong. People are going to think I don't, I'm dogging Pierce. I'm just saying, what if? You have to look at the worst-case scenario sometimes. Do I think that's going to happen? No, I think he's got the physical tools to develop. It's just a question of how fast. He's going to make an impact. It's just a question of how big. Yeah, also, um, individually, I kind of like every receiver individually that's going to make this roster. Right. The real issue is just the lack of – career production or experience it's not alec pierce's right. fault that he has no experience right. but jamar chase had no experience and he was phenomenal right off the bat so you never know a guy could come in granted you know one guy's a top 10 pick one guy goes into the second round but still you can see guys take off right out the gates as rookies it's just you don't know which guy's going to and which guy's not going to, which guy's going to have a little bit more of a learning curve and every year it's different even Pittman's year. That second round class, Claypool exploded right out the gate. But I thought Pittman was better in year two yeah. than Claypool was. But Claypool was absolutely better year one. So you just don't know. Everybody learns at different rates. Everybody grows at different rates. Everybody peaks at different rates. So you hope Pierce is ready. The problem is the way it's currently structured, he needs to be ready right out the gate. And oh, week one and two, right. we should be able to take care of business. I know we talk about the curse of week one, the curse at Jacksonville. Just on paper, curse aside, we should win both those games. And if you're 2-0, and oh, or God forbid you're not, and you can't win week one because we never do, or you can't win at Jacksonville because we never do, then you have no time to mess around because week three, we have the Chiefs, and week four, we have our first of the Titans. And then it's a quick turnaround because a couple weeks later, we have our second game against the Titans. So you got to be ready. It's not like, oh, okay, don't worry. We don't play the Titans until week 12, and we don't play them again until week 18. So Alec Pierce has plenty of time to get adjusted. It's like, now nah, we kind of need to be ready the first month of the season because we have three division games, our first four games. 
division games, it doesn't matter if it's the we Jags, can't lose those the Texans, games. or the Titans. Right. You need to win those games. Two That's... years ago, a week one division game kept us awesome. from winning the yep. division. Right. Last yep. year, we saw week one or whether it be week 18 against the Jaguars keep us out of the playoffs. So these games are extremely important. And we have three very early, three out of our first four games. And then arguably the best team or the second best team in the AFC, one of the top premier teams in the Chiefs, that third week, the home opener. So these young guys, these young receivers, they're going to hit the ground running. They have a very experienced quarterback. They have the best running back in the National Football League. That will help take the pressure off them. I think Pittman has proven himself now, but those other guys are going to have to step up. And I like them individually. I like Pierce. I like Paris Campbell if he can stay healthy. I like Strawn. I even like the Michael Harris. And we saw him two years ago. We didn't really see him last year. I like Patman. I like what we saw today. So we need to see, can it translate? Can you do it against ones and twos and threes in the secondary? Not just the guys you see, bottom of the barrel guys on the Lions depth chart in the preseason. So, And you'll have a experienced quarterback throwing to you. So you'll have... You'll have a lot of puzzle pieces in place. You got to go out there. You got to create separation. You got to make the plays. Last week, we struggled in that department. I thought the receivers were much better today. And yeah, they were good today. On. Yeah, they were they were good today. I thought they caught pretty much everything. Uh, they made plays after the catch, a lot of yak. Um, you know, so there's – look, there's always going to be positives and negatives to every preseason game. I was disappointed in the D-line, the backup D-line. We've really only got, in my opinion, six D-linemen you can trust. Outside of that, I don't know what we, you know, we, there's not going to be a rotation of eight. Um, let's just hope we get our crappy football out of the way in the preseason this year. And then our, we start fast week hey, one Jason, and just keep going. Last, last year, 3-0 you know, in the preseason opened up with a loss. I think the Lions, the year they went 0-16 or the they Browns, were year they went 0-16. I think they went, the Browns for sure. They went 4-0 in the preseason, 0-16 in the nothing. regular season. Yeah. So not only does it not matter in the preseason, I always think there's kind of a reverse jinx curse with that. So again, it's not about outcome, but you do want to see positive things from key guys or guys you're keying in on. And we didn't really see that last week with the starters. The guys who started today, today was better. So let's hope to build on it. Do we have any word about next week? Who's going to start? If we're going to see Matt Ryan, if we're going to see starters? No idea. I haven't heard anything yet. All right. So I don't I didn't listen to Reich's post game. He might have already said it. If he did, let us know in the comments like you guys did last week, because we just jumped on right afterwards, even though we don't upload it right away because I put in the graphics and a couple different things. We still we do like an instant reaction kind right. of with the post game. So we might yeah, miss Luke, some little things Luke. that Reich says after the game. Oh, Luke, I'll say story I want to tell about Jack Cohn real quick. The backup, okay, the backup, ahead. backup. Right. The, the last string, the third string or fourth string. Fourth string, fourth, yeah. Fourth string behind Ryan Foles, Ellinger, and then Cohen. I was at a bar in March in, I believe it was Sayville, Sayerville, Long Island, which is where he's from and he played high school football. I come in with the hat, and one of the guys that I met up with there, he's from that town, and this bar is like a Jonathan Taylor bar. And it's a Jack Cohn bar. It's a big Notre Dame bar because this kid was from that town. Right. So he goes to Wisconsin, plays with Jonathan Taylor. Everybody at the bar falls in love with Jonathan Taylor because they were watching Wisconsin every week. Then they follow That's him true. to the Colts. And then they follow Cohn or however you say the last name to the, uh, to the fighting Irish with Notre Dame when he goes to finish out his collegiate career. So, Everybody, I guess they listened to the podcast. They knew of the podcast. And this was in March. And the owner of the bar, and everybody's coming up to me. What are the Colts' chances of dra of, of drafting Jack? Do you think Jonathan Taylor has an input? And I was like, listen, we have Matt Ryan. We just signed Nick Foles to a two-year deal. They really like Sam Ellinger. We're not going to draft. And we drafted no. quarterbacks in back-to-back -back, mid to late rounds. We're not drafting a quarterback this year. But – practice squad i think there's a good chance because of a couple connecting to the dots one because he played with jonathan taylor and two because he played college football in the state of indiana yeah. at, no yeah. at notre dame i think that there's a chance the Colts sign him as an undrafted free agent so i just kind of threw a dart at the dartboard at this little dive bar 
in Long Island. And then it ends up happening. And I've been getting DMs and texts from all these guys in Long Island. Everybody's so excited. So he made a big play at the end of this game. Got him in the end zone with a chance to take the lead. Tire take the lead with an extra point or a two-point conversion. The Colts go for two. They don't get it. But that was a cool moment for him. A guy who's not going to make this roster. But it was a cool moment. And he made a big throw there, that back shoulder throw to the corner, front corner, front pylon of the end zone. So it's a good moment for him, a guy who, like I was saying early on, a guy who might never play a down in the NFL. You get an opportunity there in a preseason game. The drunk fans are into it, rooting for the guys in blue and white to score. So that was a good throw by him. And I was just thinking about all the guys in Long Island that were probably glued to their TVs <laughs> while most of us were like, all right, end this damn game already so we could do the podcast and get it over with. But Right. It was a hell of a drive, too. He did a nice was. job lead, leading them down the field. So I was really – like, I was super impressed. I did not think he was going to be able to do that, especially no. with the offensive line and the receivers he had on the field. So, But he did. He did an outstanding job. You never know. Maybe somebody sees this film, and I don't think he'll be on the Colts practice squad, but he could certainly – be on somebody else's practice. Well, if Sam stuff. Ellinger gets gets claimed by another team, if he were to get cut and claimed, you could see him make our practice squad. That's possible. Because they do Certainly like to have possible. that extra camp body. And he's athletic, right. so he could give you different looks in practice. If you lose Sam, you're going to want somebody sticking around that could do that. Before we go, bam, manscapes.com, 20% off plus free shipping and handling. You're killing me, man. Promo You're code so culture. Funny. Oh man, Jason, See, who doesn't need a little bowl deodorant in their life? That's or a fair point. The lawnmower 4.0 with the flashlight. I gotta go. I gotta use my manscape. Gotta stay freshly groomed for tonight. And there you have it. Week three coming up of the preseason. Colts Bucks. We'll be back with the week three preseason finale game preview on wednesday actually probably on tuesday because i'm going to charlotte this week for a work thing so we're going to try to get that done as soon as possible let's aim for tuesday a very early game preview i hope reich lets us know before then if the starters will or will not be playing that's my man jason spears i'm your host luke diamond and this is the for the culture podcast